Many of the concepts that we're familiar with from Euclidean space naturally generalize to the context of metric spaces, such as epsilon neighborhoods of points, uh, ideas of connectedness, compactness, boundedness, things like that. A lot of them can be transferred to the context of arbitrary metric spaces. However, some of the results pertaining to these different concepts might be surprising. So for instance, let's start with a metric space and let A be a subset of X. Then the following two conditions are equivalent. First, for any sequence in A, there exists a subsequence, let's even call it, uh, let's say it's a convergent subsequence whose limit is in A. And this you should recognize from one of the conditions of a subset of Euclidean space to be compact. Every open cover of A contains a finite subcover. This is another characterization of what it means for a subset of Euclidean space to be compact. And from that theorem, from, that, um, from those times, we also had a third characterization that said a subset of Euclidean space is compact if and only if it's bounded and closed. That theorem actually won't be true in general for a metric space, but before we make that statement precise, we should at least define what we mean by bounded. So by the way, any, anything um, satisfies, this is a definition and a theorem at the same time. That's a little bit bad manners, but um, A satisfying this, these conditions, is called compact. So let's give another definition. A as a subset of X is bounded if and only if there exists some distance D, which we will think of as the diameter, such that the distance between A and B is always less than or equal to D for all A and B in A. And we already know what closed means. Closed means something that contains all of its limit points. So this third statement here, which uh, we call the heine borel theorem, is false for metric spaces. And you should immediately ask, or, you know, state, I don't believe you, uh, let me see an example. Because everything I can think of in Euclidean space, this will obviously work. Um, and indeed, for many, many types of metric spaces, uh, such a theorem is true. But not all metric spaces of interest have this property. And in fact, we already are familiar with one such example. Let A be the subset of continuous functions on the unit interval such that, so f is an element of a, uh, this is a little imprecise, but such that f of the unit interval remains in the unit interval. So it's just, uh, we can actually draw these functions. So I'll, I'll give an example in a moment. Then a is actually bounded. And this immediately follows from this definition. 
Oh, and I should tell you with respect to what metric, right? We've already specified two different types of metrics on, on this space. One is the sup norm, and the other one is the um, integral norm. So I should say that is bounded with respect to the sup distance. And this follows from the fact that the distance between any two functions, f and g, well, the maximum distance it could be, since this is in the unit interval, is 1. So it's less than or equal to 1. So therefore, it's automatically bounded. It's also closed And I'll let you check this. It follows from some facts in analysis one. So we know that A is actually closed and bounded. And let's consider the following sequence of functions that start out as, so here's let's say one, here's one, and here's a half. So the first iterate of this sequence of functions has slope 2x from 0 to 1 half, and then it's 1. So let's call this f, um, just so that these numbers match. Let's say, so this is f1. Now let's cut this in half and do the same idea, but this is going to have slope 4, and then it goes off to 1. So this is f2. And that's uh, not one half, that's one fourth. It's one over two squared. Do this again, one over two to the third, that's one eighth. That has slope eight, and keep going. Now, clearly all of these functions are contained in A. We have a sequence of functions which does not converge to any element of this set because, remember, we're dealing with the sup norm. The limit of this sequence is not a continuous function and is therefore not a convergent sequence in the set of continuous functions. But not only that, by the definition of compactness, one of the equivalent definitions, this sequence better have a subsequence whose limit is an A. But this sequence has no convergent subsequence with limit in A. And in fact, it doesn't even have a convergent subsequence with limit in the set of continuous functions. And therefore, A is not compact. Even though it's closed and bounded. One of the three examples we listed earlier, cosine, iterates of cosine, and iterates of sine, we found that the first two eventually were contractions, but the iterate of sine was never a contraction even though sine x equals x obviously has a solution. What's that solution? x equals 0. So even though sine x is not a contraction, we know that there exists a unique fixed point. So what theorem could we have that guarantees the existence of fixed points in situations like this? Well, one of them is the following. Even though, by the way, even though sine x is not a contraction, it is distance decreasing. And so we have a theorem that if x is a compact metric space and f is distance decreasing, then there exists a unique fixed point, and again, that sequence that we usually always write by taking the iterates of any guess is a sequence that converges to this fixed point. The proof is a little bit lengthy, so let me instead give a sketch of this proof and outline the steps that you would need to take to prove it. So first, you can define a function on x that relates the distance between a point and its next iterate. So it sends x to the distance between f of x and x. You can check that f 
is continuous. And because f is a continuous function on a compact space, f of x as a subset of r is compact. And it's bounded from below. Well, I mean, it's already compact, so we know it's bounded from below. But uh, not only that, the infimum of f of x, and if you look at the infimum, what it's saying is, when is the distance between any point in x and f of x equal, is, is as close as possible? So the inf of f of x exists and is an element of fx. And therefore there exists a smallest distance between some point x here and f of x. The claim is that this distance is actually equal to zero. And this implies that f has a fixed point. And by the proof that we've actually outlined before that shows the uniqueness of a fixed point under a contraction, under a contraction actually transfers to the proof that um, a fixed point is unique even for a distance decreasing function if one exists. That's also something I leave for you as an exercise. Um, so it has a unique fixed point. Now all we have to do is check that for an arbitrary point, the sequence of iterates of that point actually converges to the fixed point. So using the same notation as before, notice that the distance between and let me call this fixed let me call this fixed point something let's call it y so notice that the distance between any iterate of x0 and y is actually equal to because these are fixed because y is a fixed point i can pull out one of the f's here and i'll have fn minus 1 x0 and here I'll have f of y. At this point, I can use the dec distance decreasing assumption, and this is strictly less than, or equal to, depends on if they're equal, the distance from fn minus 1, x naught to y. And in fact, I can keep doing this. So keep doing this over and over and over again. until you get down to the bottom. And what you notice that if I read this backwards, I get a sequence of numbers. So call this number 0, then this one is number 1, and so on. Here's number, in this case it would be n minus 1. This is number n. The sequence of these distances, that's decreasing. And it's bounded from below by 0, Therefore, this sequence converges by the monotone convergence theorem. to a number greater than or equal to zero. In fact, you can show that this number equals zero. And what that means is that the distance between the nth iterates eventually get infinitesimally close to y, which exactly means that that sequence converges to y as well. So that actually concludes the proof. So this gives us yet another condition on a metric space that guarantees the existence of a unique fixed point, even if you don't have a contraction. However, what we do need, a sufficient condition, would be that the space is compact and you have a distance decreasing function. And we know that contraction implies distance decreasing, but not conversely, so the additional assumption of compactness is indeed needed here to guarantee the existence of a unique fixed point.